Uh, good evening, and this is our uh, Orthodoxy Adult Education class here at St. Elizabeth in Woodstock, Georgia, on Christ Silence on the Cross. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who, for those of you here tonight that haven't met me before, I'm Deacon Andrew White. Um, I'm here. I'm joined by by Father Matthew Dutko, the parish priest here, um, and we're going to be working on this class together a little bit. Uh, but we're going let's get into the class. In just a moment here, but first, I would like uh, Father Matthew to lead us with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O heavenly King, the Comforter, O Spirit of Truth, who art in all places and fills all things, treasurer of blessings and giver of life, come and dwell. And cleanse us from every blemish, and save our souls, O blessed one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is among us. He is and ever shall be. Um, so today's lesson will be on Christ's silence on the cross. Uh, this coming Sunday is the uh, Sunday of the cross during Lent. Um, and there's a lot to talk about with the cross. You could spend days and days just talking about any number of things. You can talk about 17 different subjects on the cross. But what I really want to focus on uh, today is the fact that Christ was silent, um, both while he was being arrested, while he was being tried, and while he was on the cross. And it's no co coincidence that um, the early church, and that the church today, places a very high value on silence. There's even some uh, monastics and some uh, some of the church fathers say that silence is the quickest path to virtue and the quickest path to salvation. Um, there's, it's very practical, too, that I think most of us uh, can, can think back to something we've said that we immediately wish we could have taken back. And when I, when I was a teacher, and uh, as a teacher, I'd have middle school students that would blurt things out, and I'd always tell them, you know, think back to the, you know, think back to all the things you said that you wish you could take back or the things that make you cringe when you look back on them. And, um, you know, how, how few of those moments you have if you didn't ever say anything impulsively. Um, so silence is something that, that the church holds in very high esteem, um, not least of all because it was how Christ approached his suffering and his passion. Um, there's many throughout the Passion narrative in the Gospels. You can see how Christ was silent while he was on the cross. And throughout the Old Testament, you can see that silence being foreshadowed, either by someone uh, prophesying, sizing that the Messiah would be silent when he was being, when he was sacrificing himself for the world, or by other, uh, by other prophets who fell short of that mark when they were suffering, uh, refusing to be silent, and how that was, uh, would be then fulfilled by Christ being silent and suffering perfectly, where the prophets were not able to do that. Um, so in Luke chapter 23 in the Passion narrative, we see that when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been waiting to see him. This is Luke chapter 23, verse 8 through 9. Um, from what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave, no, gave him no answer. Um, there are many times when Christ was being um, uh, pried by the Pharisees or at his, at his trial, that he just would not give an answer. He refused to give an answer. Um, and the reason for this is in part because the, the truth stands for itself, uh, that Christ is truth. He's the very personification of the truth of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the love that exists in that community, and the, the love that that community has for the world. Um, and because he's truth in and of himself, he does not, his ministry was able to stand for itself. They weren't the... Um, the crowd was not condemning Jesus on any sort of individual charge. They had chosen charges, but they were condemning his, his, whole, um, his whole being, in a sense, that mankind was condemning God unjustly. Um, and there was nothing that God was going to say uh, to defend that. Um, it, there was nothing that God needed to say in his defense because he was truth. He did not need to defend the truth. The truth was going to come out in three days. And then later in Luke chapter 23, this is verses 14 to 15, uh, the gardener said to them, you brought me this man as, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here, um, but this is, um, this is Pilate. 
Um, so 23, 14 through 15 is Pilate, and is saying to them, you brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion, and I have examined him in your presence, and have found no basis for the charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. That Christ did not even need to defend himself, and the people tried him came to the conclusion that this man is not, that this man is being unjustly um, charged. But, yes? Uh, I love this this uh, idea and how you're laying this out, and it, it made me think of uh, how Christ is always the great teacher, even in silence and doing nothing. He's mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how often on the flip side, for us, uh, even when we do deserve it and when we are wrong, we still try to defend ourselves uh, with, with lies and, uh, and we can become angry. And it's just amazing to see um, how Christ is, is even, even just with, with no words at all teaching such a powerful lesson. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good good lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, it, it, and we learned that we learned that through Christ on the cross that he he really, the people judging him really came to the conclusion without his without him defending himself at all that he was innocent. Uh, they tried him nonetheless because everyone was passing the buck and no one wanted to um, no one wanted to be the one to set him free. Um, so no, I think people people miss that all the time. I think in the in the scripture that you hear on Good Friday or if you come to one of our Pay the Russian churches and go to the, the Malevin to the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the scripture reading that you hear, the, the last line is how uh, the crowd leaves beating their breast. And if you don't really know what that means, it's just like, okay, they left and they were hitting themselves mm -hmm. in the chest. But that is a sign that they realized that what they did was wrong. Yeah. Uh, so even instantly, all these people left going, whoa, that was, that was a big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We should have not have done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, exactly. And, and with that silence, they came to that conclusion with no one said, pointed out, hey, we made a mistake here. That just Christ being silent, everyone, the truth was revealed. And then at the resurrection, Luke 24, 6 through 8, um, the gardener says to him, he is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you. While he was still in, with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they, meaning the apostles, remembered his words. So the apostles, just based on his public ministry, came to the conclusion that, or were reminded of that, that part of the ministry and, and knew what had taken place after being reminded by the gardener. Um, so Christ did not have, he had said everything he had already needed to say, to allow the events to take place. While, while still being in control of them as God, um, but he did not make any effort to defend himself because his very being was his defense. Who he was was all the defense that he needed. Um, and and this, this attitude that he was like a lamb being led to the slaughter that's not going to open his mouth, that he was, he was like the Paschal sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice for the world. He was God's Passover lamb. He was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Is you know, even even though you know he knows the suffering that's going to come, uh, he also knows how he's going to handle it, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he prepares for that in the garden when he's praying. And, uh, just a, another example, always, yeah. always not just teaching us with words, but showing us what to do when when you're distraught, when when you're preparing for suffering. Um, go to the garden to pray. Yeah, that's, that's what we're doing here. Yeah, right? yeah, that's what that's why we we need to to be here right now. Um, and so at the beginning of, of uh, liturgy, before, while the priest is preparing the uh, communion, he, he uh, prays something from the book of Isaiah. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Um, so it, it was prophesied that this, this silence was going to be very crucial uh, to Christ's sacrifice. That the fact that he had, that he needed, not only that he it's not that he had no defense, it's that he needed no defense. Um, was was prophesied uh, long before Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. Um, I'm going to get back to that quote on that next page. I kind of want to jump ahead, being we're on the Old Testament, uh, to Job. And here we see, um, in this quote from Job, if you're following along at home, you're going to have to go way back to Job 33. Um, in this quote from Job, um, from the book of Job, we see how Job is, Job foreshadows the, um, the death of Christ. You have this man who was righteous, who had done absolutely nothing wrong, and is handed over to all sorts of trials. And then when he endures the trials, and he never, he never um, turns himself away from the trials, 
Um, when he's done enduring trials, everything is restored to him twice over. Just like how Christ, who had done nothing wrong, who had uh, no reason to suffer, was given over to all these trials, who gave himself over all these trials. And then when they were done, he was, he was resurrected. Um, it, Job foreshadows that death and resurrection of Christ. Um, but Job, didn't hand, he handled it righteously, but he did not handle it as perfectly as Christ did. He had a lot of questions. It's, is typical when you're suffering from a lot of things uh, that you don't know the, the reason for. He, he never doubted God, but he did say, what, like, why me? Why is this happening? This doesn't make any sense. This is crazy. Can you please stop? <laughs> um, and God uh, met Job and say, said, pay attention. This is Job 33, 31 to 33. Uh, pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Keep silent and let me speak. Then if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me, keep silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Um, Christ never really, the pre-incarnate Christ, when God speaks to Job uh, in the whirlwind, he never really gives him an answer. He never says, this is why you're suffering. Um, and because if Job had heard that it was because Christ was trying to prove that he's, prove that how righteous he is and to bless Job even further, that answer may not have sat well with Job. I think if we had heard, like, we're suffering because, you know, here's the reason why we're suffering. I don't think we'd want to hear that. So Christ withheld that from Job. But he did say, I desire to justify you, and if you keep silent, I will teach you wisdom. That um, he's just asking for Job's obedience. And obedience, a lot of times when we hear the word obedience, we think of like a master being like, shoot, to his dog. Um, I, you bother me, go away, just do what I say because it makes me more comfortable. Um, that's not how the church understands obedience at all. Especially my dog. Yeah, especially, especially <laughs> Rambo. Um, yeah, he's always like, jumping on you. Um, but then, so there's this, um, the, people think of obedience as the, like a master and a dog, but the obedience in the church is, uh, it's almost like a, a relationship built on trust and love, almost like a trust ball. Like when you have someone standing in front of you and you say, fall backwards and I'll catch you, you're being obedient. Because they're knowing that you have the that you have their best intentions at heart, and then you're not going to back away and let them fall and laugh. Um, it's well, this, and, and you have your you know the, the father and the son. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the father loves the son, and so they want what's best for them. Um, sometimes that means that the the child doesn't understand exactly why something is happening. Mm -hmm. But in the end, the father you have to trust that the father has the best intention. That's the way the relationship is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it's done right, that's what it is. The, the father or the mother is always doing everything for the child. Um, sometimes the child doesn't understand, uh, but that's okay because they're being cared for by somebody who does understand. And that's the way it is with God. We, we, we're his children, he's our father, and he understands what we need even if we don't understand it. And he knows what we need, uh, we pray in the best words. He knows what we need before we ask for our aware of it. Or maybe it's in the liturgy. Probably both. <laughs> yes. I get it. But, but, but it, it, it's, it's like a parent relation, a parent and child relationship. Um, that's the type of obedience we're called to have, that we know that you have our best intentions at heart, because, and Christ has proven that, he's had, that he has our best intentions at heart, even giving himself over to death. So we trust him completely because he's giving himself to, he's giving himself to us completely. Um, and in that silence, in that sitting there and waiting for God to teach us what it is that we need to hear, um, that is where we learn God's wisdom. It's not in um, demanding to know what the answers are. It's God reveals that wisdom to us uh, slowly over time. And the stuff that we, we don't get the answers to are just things we didn't need. We're always given everything we need to come to Him. Um, so that, that silence was, and that obedience and that peace, but really the, the peace was what Christ demanded of Job, um, because in that, that if he was peaceful, unlike if you can, going back to the dog analogy, like if you're trying to give a dog uh, medicine, usually they start jerking their head left and right, it would, make a lot, it would make it a lot simpler for everybody if the dog would just, you know, lie still because we're trying to help the dog, but instead it's jerking its, hands, its head around because it doesn't have any peace, if it would just be at peace. It can receive what it needs. Um, so in that silence, we begin um, building that, that mindset of peace that we can just patiently accept whatever wisdom God has prepared for us in whatever trial it is that we're facing.
So I'm going to back up a little bit. Does anybody have any questions so far? Are there any questions uh, coming in through the internet? Not yet. We, we have one comment from Father Michael that's, that says the peanut gallery, shh. <laughs> <laughs> so, the if you want to address that comment. What makes this work? <laughs> Deacon Andy and I are always on the same page. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's like, it's a, it's it's like, like a ping pong match. It's like, it's like we went to the same seminary or something. It's almost like we, we had the same time. <laughs> but, it, but since we're talking about Job, I, I always remember in our scripture class, our professor, uh, Father Ken, to paraphrase him when he would talk about this. Uh, and Job is, is there in the whirlwind and he's questioning. And ultimately, God's response is being, and again, it's a paraphrase of scripture, but that. Uh, you know, were you there when I created the heavens and yeah. I had the earth in my hand? Yeah. You know, no. So how can you understand the answer to the question that you're asking in the first place? Yeah. So the reality is that if we trust God to take care of us, uh, if we believe in him, it means that we trust him and that we don't need all those answers uh, yeah. to begin with. Yeah. And that's yeah. where the peace and silence come from, too. If you're not always questioning, that's where you become at peace. Yeah. Yeah. Because, and, and like, and peace is, uh, I think, or silence is something that it starts with the mouth. And there's a quote in here later on this thing we're going to get to that, but silence really starts with the mouth. But if, like, I'm one of those people where if something, if something absolutely bizarre happens in front of me and I'm, like, I'll quietly start to process it and so you, like, you get the circles, like, when YouTube's buffering in your eyes. But I'll never, I'll never, like, you know, I, I won't say anything, but inside I have, I, what do I have to do? I, I really have to respond to this. There's got to be something. And there's, so there's that silence on the outside, but on the inside, there's not, just because there's silence on the outside doesn't mean there's not silence internally. And the ultimate goal is to also have that silence internally where it's just, okay, God put me in this moment now and there's something I have. Not that I'm going to do nothing, not that I'm just going to sit there and say, let's let whatever's going to happen happen, but that there is some answer and it'll be revealed to me as soon as I need it. If it's an emergency, that answer probably will be revealed to me pretty quickly. If someone's, you know, like breaks, falls and breaks an arm, I don't, it doesn't take a lot of time for anyone to figure out what needs to be done there. Um, but, you know, in situations like we're seeing today, um, it does take time. And the answers are slowly coming to us, and they're slowly coming to us through a lot of different sources. Um, but through peace, we can, and through silence, we can filter out and take the answers we need and let the answers that we don't need just uh, go away. I, I think uh, you said it, but I, I just want to say it again because that it's that important that the silence that we think about it just means you're not talking mm -hmm. you're not making sound but the real silence is when the gears are not ticking in a way that is making you try to find the answer that you that, and it's actually even a, a pride thing where we we're trying to tick around in our brain to solve problems that we can't even understand the source of of it in the first place yeah um, yeah these are spiritual things of course there's answers to the questions and we need to think about them that's not what i'm saying but yeah. But what I'm, I'm saying is if you want to be at peace, it's when you stop wrestling in your mind. That's yeah. where the silence is. You could actually be talking all the time and be silent. Yeah. More so than you could not talk all the time and be silent. Yeah. If that, you get what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like it, the, like, um, the idea of, uh, like, when, when the apostles were in the boat, I have, I have an icon on the, up on the next page, and the storm comes, and Christ gets up and calms the storm. It's almost like... That that calms that calms sea like calm blue ocean is what uh, what silence is really um, supposed to look like internally. That you can be you sure. Know, and the apostles could have been sitting there not opening their mouths at all, and inside they're thinking, "We're totally gonna die. Yeah. I'm supposed to say I'm I'm toast." Yeah. And, and they're not being silent at all, yeah. even if they were being quiet in the, in the moment of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then in, in Christ with his trust in the Father. Um, Slept for slept while the storm was going on. That's a that's a very high level of peace. Um, and in the, the icon in this in the, I'll hold it up. I don't know if anyone at home can actually see it, but the icon actually depicts him sleeping and calming the storm in the in the same icon. Um, that you know it's, it's almost like you can picture him waking up and wondering why everyone's so why everyone's so freaked out about the storm going on because uh, all we have to do is calm the storm. Um, and there was a, uh, when, I, when we were, in, when I was in seminary, we'd do these <coughs> inter-seminary movements and we'd visit other seminaries and we'd all, all the seminaries that year would get together and discuss things. And we were at St. Tecon's once. Um, and the abbot at St. Tecon's met with us, he was an Archimandrite, I think his, 
his name escaped me. I want to see his art domain trace, Sergius. I'm sure someone. I wasn't someone, there, so I can't. You, were, you can't help me with this. This is my senior year. You were, you were already, you were already working. Uh, but he said that that the aim of prayer is that our minds are really just like bup, 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 bup all the time. And the aim of prayer is to turn that bup, bup, bup into a dialogue with Christ. Um, instead of just talking to ourselves mentally all the time, we're sharing those those thoughts with Christ. And we're, we're trying to be silent internally so that we can have that conversation um, with Christ. Like, we can't have a conversation with somebody else that thinking all the time. Yeah, so, that's an awesome way to say that. Um, turn, well, I should go back and hit that slide with Pontius Pilate on it that I, that I skipped over. Um, we spent a lot of time on, on uh, talking about silence and peace in a crisis, but uh, St. Ignatius uh, in the cup of Christ says, The Lord remained silent before Pilate and Herod. He made no attempt to justify himself. You must imitate this holy and wise silence when you see that your enemies accuse you with every intention of certain conviction. They accuse only with the purpose of hiding their own evil intent, intent intention under the guise of judgment. So just because somebody is, and this is not necessarily a crisis, but just because someone's wagging their finger at you and saying all these, you know, evil things about you like they did with Christ, it does not mean that they're doing it because you've done anything wrong. Um, sometimes it could mean any number of things. We can't see what's in somebody else's heart. And trying to figure it out is just going to spin your head in circles. Um, so when, we're, um, when uh, we're being judged by others, we also have to maintain that same spirit of silence um, because we don't know what's in their heart. We have to, we have, to have that kind of um, faith in our... In, not that faith in ourselves, but that relationship with Christ that everything we're doing, we feel, can stand for itself. Um, you know, and, and that requires a lot of work, and that requires a lot of um, uh, humility in admitting our own faults, but that idea that there is nothing that we do that we should necessarily be ashamed of and need to explain to others. Um, that our actions and our words will speak for themselves. Um, if that. This, the, yeah, the silence, as, as, especially as we're being judged, that's the goal of any other kind of silence, even. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe that's too strong of a way to put it, but, you know, that is the lesson that Christ is showing us, and that is the, the thing that brings peace. And ultimately, um, ultimately, not that it should be the goal, but that is the, the just, if you're seeking to be justified, that's where you'll find it, whether it's in this life or in the life to come. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, the justification will be there yeah. through your silence. If you're, if what you have to say is true, or if what you have done is for Christ and not for yourself or for the world or for something else. Yeah, ultimately, everything we do, whether someone judges us for it or not, is ultimately going to be between us and God. Even if it's something we do completely in secret, and nobody even has anything to say about it, but we know it was wrong. It's ultimately <clears throat> um, going to be something that there is, you know, is going to be. Be presented. The deeds will be revealed. Yeah, every, everything, everything that's hidden will be revealed, and um, the only there is no defense on the. You know, like Bishop Gregory always says, "What are you going to do? Bring out boxes of evidence." Uh, the only defense of the judgment seat is to ask for mercy. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's really no need to waste time trying to explain our actions. People are smart; they usually can figure out what we're, what we, what we mean when we do things. Um, so that quick yeah. side note, uh, yeah. a little sidebar. <laughs> Uh, this reminded me of, the, of another lesson from seminary. That's what happens when you get two classmates together, <laughs> like, reminiscing as we're doing this. Uh, this is going to be a uh, resource. Yeah, I remember uh, one of our professors, Father Jonathan Tobias, um, he taught, uh, amongst other classes, he taught the, uh, the, the, the sermon preaching classes. Um, and, and he give us this example of kind of like how sometimes you could use a prop in a sermon, right? And, and you, don't, you, know, you don't always see that the priest using a prop, but he, he brought it up and, and, and showed us as an example of how, um, you know, he took a, like a set of encyclopedias, basically, and, you know, he said that um, and he had to, and he had a notebook. And in the little notebook, the, there was a man who went around and he wrote in that notebook every time somebody wronged him, he, he wrote what they did and their name and the date in the book, and he kept on to it because in his mind he was justifying what he was doing, saying, I don't want to be hurt again, and if I, if I don't write it down, I'll forget, and then they're just going to hurt me again. And we think about that all the time, when we hold things against people, you know, part of the reason why is because maybe they've hurt us and we don't want to be hurt again. So it's hard to let those things go. Um, and, and then he's, so he has his little notebook and he's talking about the guy, and 
and when he, and the guy dies and, and he's standing there, you know, at the judgment seat and he's got his little book and, and you know, his, his guardian angel or whoever, uh, for the purposes of this, you know, fictional kind of story, uh, this parable, uh, says, you know, you need to put the book down. And he goes, I can't, I can't put the book down because if I get rid of the book, I won't, I won't remember who hurt me. And then they could hurt me again. And, and then it's, you know, God is, is there and it's, he, that's when the encyclopedias come out and he says, you know, if you let go of, uh, of your book, then I'll let go of mine. And so it's the one little, you yeah. know, tiny sized notebook that you write memos in versus the set of encyclopedias of all the things that you have done to, yeah. to hurt God. To yeah. offend God. Not yeah. Hurt him, but can't be hurt, but to but to sin against him. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and um yeah. Forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive us. Exactly. We don't we don't know you know we don't know what things uh we've done to so a lot of times when when we're offended, it's or when we offend others, it's unintentional. So the whole lot of those things is really um, you know, like like I was saying uh, before we can't figure out what's some, in, in somebody else's heart. So to keep on to these and to have that lack of that internal silence and peace over what someone did to you, they may have cut you off just because they didn't see you there. They may have, you know, said something angry about you because they were just having a bad day. And today was, you know, you happen to be the one in their crosshairs when they were, when they, when it was last straw. Um, so, we, you know, we don't know. Uh, John, yes. Uh, well, we have a comment from your dad oh, who awesome. says uh, <laughs> both he and your mom are watching. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Hello. important to me. <laughs> Hope you guys are having a nice evening in New Jersey. <laughs> Obeying the curfew that, okay, the curfew that's in New Jersey now. Um, so, uh, the next page, are there, were there any other questions or is it just the two comments? Okay, awesome. Um, next page, uh, well, it's a couple pages down. It's the one that's just a quote. Um, Sometimes silence is not indicative of a lack of things to say, but a wise withdrawal until God provides the right opportunity for a response. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like it's very common that we feel like we just need to fill the air. Um, I remember my priest back in Jersey would always say that it's very easy as a young priest to feel like you just got to keep talking when someone brings a problem to you because you have to fix it. And the best thing you can do is just shut up and let them talk. Um, because, you know, a lot of times it's, it's an extension of ego and that lack of, of peace that is, well, something has to happen now. It must be my, it must be my responsibility. So I'm going to say something just so that there's not silence. Um, and my, my uncle, uh, Father Jim Dutko in Binghamton, New York, uh, at St. Michael's. When I, I call him, sometimes I have a problem with something, and I'm trying to I'm trying to fix it because that's what we think we always have. We think we have that in our marriages, when anybody brings you a problem, you you know, in our mind, we want to think that we can fix it, and, and sometimes we can't. Yeah. And and so he always he'll say to me if I start to get like you know out of control with my with my desire to try to fix something, he goes, you're not Dr. Phil. I, I can't tell you how many times he said this to me. You're not Dr. Phil, you can't, you can't fix it. Yeah. And then, okay, but that, then you let go and, and trust that God is gonna be the one that can fix the problem if, if the person wants to cooperate. Do you remember the, the video we had to watch? I think it was one of the our other branches counseling class with um, the nail in the forehead and the wife is sitting with it, her husband and she's like, I got this, this throbbing pain and I don't know, and he's like, well, you have a nail in <laughs> And she's like, I think, no, it's just, it hurts so much. It's I right around here. It's right, yeah. <laughs> like, just maybe if you just, like, and she, like, smacks his hand. And then he stops, he's like, that must be really painful. And she's like, you're so understanding. <laughs> and there's this, 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 like, an ego thing that we have to, you know, like, puppet master and fix everything for everybody. Um, but we, we really can't impact anybody until we love them the way they are first and accept that, you know, people have to come to these realizations themselves um, that whether it's, you know, whether it's an issue you have with person with someone or whether someone's stockpiling toilet paper, um, if that's something they shouldn't be doing, they'll come to that realization themselves. We don't have to fill the air with all the pros and cons of, of you know, our opinion on everything. We don't need to always have our two cents. Um, we may have opinions on things, but other people may just not care. Um, and, to, to, and then we open the door to have less peace when we've shared that opinion. And everyone says, no, I think that's crazy. Now, now we're offended, and now we're angry at people, and now we're writing in that book again of all the people that have wronged us. Well, there's, um, there's a, you know, I don't know if you saw any of these things going around, these kind of like memes of, of, of uh, coronavirus <clears> things <throat> to try to, kind of try to make us laugh in the midst of uh, some craziness going on around us. 
this, this one picture of a, a, a lady with a shopping cart full of milk. Uh, it's on every, it's double stacked in the cart and on the bottom it's filled and she's pushing it through the store and the comment on the bottom is like, you know, you know that expires in 10 days and you can't <laughs> drink all that milk. And so, you know, and if you needed a gallon of milk, you might have seen that lady and been furious with her. But you don't, she might be going to the orphanage where they need yeah. to drink all that milk and that might be the only milk that they get yeah. you know, until it comes back again. So if you knew what, if you knew what the depths of the person's heart and soul were, you would be far less inclined to judge them. Yeah. It's like if the person on the highway behind you is honking at you and they fly, fly by and, and they're screaming at you, you know, you're going to get mad and say, this guy's reckless. Well, what if you knew that his kid just got hit by a car and he was trying to get to the hospital before he died? Yeah. You'd instantly be, uh, you pull right over and say, go, sir, please go. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm in your way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. So you, don't, you don't know why the other person behind you. That inner dialogue that is, when we're not being silent is often based totally on our own selfish idea of the way yeah. that we think it should be, not in the way that it is. And the, and the amount of times I have gotten so distracted because someone, you know, there's so many times you just get distracted because someone cut you off and then because you're not focusing, you cut somebody else off. So maybe that person was just <laughs> distracted because they were like, they were in the same spot you are now. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it, it starts this chain uh, because the natural reaction is there's, you know, it's, it's like there's a saber tooth tiger, there's a threat, I gotta defend myself. And whether it's you know a crisis like we see in the news, and we're defending ourselves with you know any number of any number of mechanisms, or whether it's someone saying something evil about us, and we're defending ourselves by getting angry because anger is a powerful emotion. It's hard to feel hurt when you're you know busy making a list of why the other person that hurt you is um, is you know the villain in, in your own private story. Uh, we think of ourselves as the main character. Or the hero, the supporting character. <laughs> Christ is the main character. Um, you know our, what happens to us is. No matter who we are, there's always something going on in the background. Um, and uh, this one last quote I really like about silence is, if you, have, if you are silent, you will have peace wherever you live. And it really did bring to mind the, the bridegroom icon that we see a lot during Lent. And we see Christ is, you know, he's with the lance, he's on the cross, or he's, he's carrying his cross, however, whatever's happening that's depicted this way. Um, and He's, his eyes are downcast, he's obviously mourning, but this isn't the face of somebody that's, uh, is it on the camera? Am I, okay, I'm, I'm, my, <laughs> my blocking is good. Uh, this isn't the face of somebody that's in anguish. This isn't the face, this is the face most of us make when we get bad news. Um, and Christ was, had the burden of, you know, knowing what the original intention for each and every one of us was, and seeing all of these people, and seeing the people who were nailing the, him to the cross, and knowing, what was what their original intention was before the the uh, the fall of of um, before the fall of creation, knowing what their original purpose was, and that was to come come to him. Um, so he's downcast, but he also has the faith. And this is a man that's about to die, and he's downcast, but he has the faith that and the trust and the obedience to the Father that he's going to be raised up on the third day. So he, even though he's even though he's um, uh, downcast, and even though he's sad and he's mourning, um, he's not, he hasn't lost his peace. He hasn't lost his silence. Um, it's, it's a man who knows, it's the face of a man who, who knows he has something to endure, but that it will be over eventually. Um, are there any questions coming from the internet? Because we're about done. I don't know what time, I left my phone in the Saturday. I don't know what time it is. It's, it's, uh, I think, you know, that, that was a great lesson, Deacon Andy. Thank you for, for sharing with us this evening and preparing this. Uh, I just would add, not about the lesson, which, which again was, was great, just that um, it's a joy to, to be able to share with anybody who is participating this evening, members of our church or anyone else uh, that's not here with us. And if anybody has any idea for uh, some kind of lesson that they would like to specifically know about we are planning to do this every wednesday evening and every friday evening uh, as long as we're uh, able to, to be here and do this and so if there's some kind of question that you've always had uh, or or lesson that you think would really be engaging or, or pertinent to the time that we're in right now uh, if you can email that to me at, at father at gmail.com or do the inbox uh, message on Facebook.
I'm not good at Facebook, so I don't know what it's called, but uh, John knows what it's called. Oh, John, you can say what it's called when you when someone uh, says yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when yeah. A, a Facebook yeah, message. Facebook yeah, message. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, anyway, we thank you again, Deacon Andy, and everybody for being here. Oh, do we have a question? Got, um, oh, um, Deacon Stephen. Uh, this is. Oh. <laughs> he, he says this is a great media to be able to participate remotely. Oh, awesome! Awesome! I'm glad that I'm glad that it worked out for everybody. This is our our uh, second recording with a, a new setup that we have in the church, uh, and and um, you know this is a, a really hard time in so many ways for so many folks. Uh, just the change of our life being so drastic from just a few days ago, a week ago, ten days ago. The world was very different, and so uh, what a blessing that we have this ability to be close to each other, even though we're maybe we're far away physically. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it, and we look forward to continuing to try to make uh, some lemons into lemonade over the next couple of weeks. So may the blessing of the Lord be upon you with uh, prayers for peace and health all over.